Um, so this, this, this is really nice. Um, again, my name is Scott Kuby. Uh, I am a, the lead content strategist at Wolfram. We make Wolfram Alpha, Mathematica, System Modeler, um, and lots of other uh, high-end technical computing things. Uh, I was a radio TV major, so I am not involved in making the high-end technical computing software. Uh, I do communication stuff, marketing stuff, um, and I'm part of a larger user, user experience team at Wolfram. Um, I'm on Twitter as at Scott Rocket Ship. Um, you can find me there. And the slides for this are at kubi.co slash VMT. Those letters will make a little more sense here in a bit. Uh, kubi.co slash VMT. Um, and there's also a printout that you can grab um, that has the framework I'll be describing, um, which, I don't know, might be kind of fun. Um, and it's all available in Italian now. Some Italian content marketing site just like translated and posted it today, so that's kind of fun. Um, so do we ha is anyone in the room a content strategist? Like, could you put it on your, on your business card? Nice, very nice. Um, who's involved uh, right now in like sort of, in any respect, you know, be, be generous with your definition, but sort of like shaping, you know, the direction of content production for a given initiative? A lot of people. Okay, cool. Um, so when I uh, joined Wolfram, this is about two years ago now, um, I had, uh, the, the original job posting was for a user interface writer. They needed someone who could come in and help with sort of the nitty gritty microcopy stuff on the application interfaces. Um, it's something I'd been doing at an app startup um, for a couple of years before, so I was, I was really very excited about it. Um, but I'd gotten more involved in information architecture, um, had kind of been exposed to the world of content strategy, and so that's what I was really interested in pursuing. Um, so I kind of pushed for that to be added to, to my job title. Um, and they let me, so, you know, hooray! I'm a content strategist now. Um, and so being, I was the first content strategist at the organization. Um, so the company's over 25 years old. They've been publishing to the web since you could publish to the web. Um, we have a, a lot of web pages. We have a lot of web pages. Um, and so being the first content strategist on a younger team, a lot of the work that I had to do was just sort of figuring out what content strategy was going to mean within the organization. Right? Like I'd read the books and I'd gone to the conferences and I have content strategy for the web and you know, picked up later mobile content strategy and content strategy at work and all the great stuff. Um, and so I you just kind of started doing what the book said. Like, all right, let's do a content inventory. So I open up Excel and start inventorying content and, and doing all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I sort of kept feeling like I didn't have the whole picture, right? Like, okay, I sort of get what content strategy is and I'm sort of starting to get like, what the organization is and what we're doing, but I wasn't sure how to connect the dots. Um, and so like once you finally get the job title, like once someone says, yes, we want you to do content strategy, um, you, you have to get very real about it in practice and not just in theory. Um, and one of the, the challenges that I had um, is, is understandably so, like if, you know, once you joined on, it's like, oh, we finally, we have a person to figure out all of this stuff. So just, Every problem that had been building up, you know, forever and ever, like finally just tipped over and comes flooding down about how we don't have governance around any of this stuff and how there's no consistent voice and tone. And, you know, it's been for 10 years we have not known whether to capitalize this or not, right? Like some of the some of the real detailed stuff, um, some of the big picture stuff. Um, and so these problems are all coming at me, and you know, the, the instinct, the easy, like, the, the instinct that could have occurred would be like, okay, well, let's just jump in and try and fix all these problems as they come. Um, but that it was so big, right? Like, it was so big. There's, there's, there's so much to the organization and to all of our initiatives and to any given product design. Um, I, I just knew that I couldn't do it all. Like, there's gonna be no way to solve all of these content problems, like, as they came in. So I started, like, pushing back a little bit. Uh, I'm kind of a pushy guy. And so I, I'm asking a lot of questions, right? Like why this, why that, um, as, as folks in, in uh, these types of events tend to do. Um, and just drawing on my own personal experience from, from being an arts organizer, from doing some activism work, um, even I've got a bit of a background in radio, right? We're always trying to find like what's the really concise message around this thing we're trying to communicate. Um, and so I'd be asking people why um, on any given project. And a lot of times the answer was, I don't know. Right, I'm kind of executing on a vision that's come from wherever, and I'm just I'm trying to do the work, right? So I'm I'm maybe architecting the interactions for this this project, and yeah, I don't know, I don't know why. Um, I had a really nice moment. Um, I, I'm in Des Moines, Iowa. I work from my home 
there, uh, Wolfram's in Illinois, and so periodically I, I go down and work on site. Um, and they'd done like a stakeholder mapping exercise um, that I hadn't been able to attend. Uh, and so they, they, I found my name on the whiteboard, like in my manager's office, and like the bottom sticky note is what that person is always con is like most concerned with. Um, and so under my name, under content strategy, they put, are we asking the right question and are we solving the right problem? Which sounds an awful lot like design, right? Like that's kind of the questions that designers are asking. And so, so that's what I've been, been wrestling with a little bit is more like, am I doing content strategy? Am I doing product design? Um, you know, to me, it's, it's just trying to, to get the work done and find ways to improve, um, improve the quality of our content. And so sometimes the, the answer was, I don't know. And sometimes it, it was, um, I, I, like, I don't understand. You know, someone's handed me a thing. I'm working on a project, and I don't understand it. I don't understand where this fits. I don't maybe necessarily understand um, the vision of it. And when, when I would be tr working with people who would say that they did not have a complete understanding of the initiative, of the thing that we were trying to do, um, that, that, to me, was a really important area to focus in on. Because um, I think the quality of our work is really inherently limited by our understanding. You know, how much we're willing to push back and ask questions and really get in our brains a picture um, of the thing we're working on. Um, and, and something that I found uh, frequently, and this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is common in a lot of organizations, but sometimes the design constraints that we, that we were seeing or that someone seemed to, to be bringing to me on a project were just sort of imaginary. Like, the const like you know, can we change this? Well, I, I don't think we can change that. Well, why can't we change it? Um, I don't know. I don't know why we can't change it. Okay, let's, let's push back on it a little bit. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Mr. Charles Eames um, and this, this quote, you know, never delegate understanding. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, from the perspective of being a content strategist, um, I have a model I'm going to kind of walk through that I think is my take on, on content strategy and maybe how it relates to product design. Um, and, and to a certain extent, organizational design. Um, because I, I think to be able to do our jobs really effectively, we have to completely and fully understand our organization. We have to completely and fully understand the vision. Uh, if you're doing content strategy, developing a content strategy, and you don't understand the vision, to me, that's kind of like packaging design, right? Like, here's the thing. You know, and just don't ask too many questions about it, but we need to put it in a box. So if you could just design the box, please, to make it really palatable, um, that would be great. Um, and packaging design is important, but it's, it's, it's not the type of work that, it, that I think a lot of us want to be doing. So I find, I find clarity to be very empowering, right? Once I understand something, I, I'm empowered to do work. I can kind of, kind of move with a bit of gusto, a bit of zest, once I fully understand something. Um, and so I've started to see my role more as almost a facilitator of understanding, to help the people on the team and within the organization know, really, like really fully understand why we're in the room, why we're doing the thing that we're doing, how it relates to all of the other things that we're doing or could be doing. Um, and that clarity, I think, can, can really be provided by content strategists, right? A lot of the muscles that we've had to develop to deal with content problems, uh, change management, facilitation, prioritization, articulation. Um, these are things that we don't just need at the web level, right? We need this at the organization level. We need to understand and articulate and have the messaging and vision around why we even exist. And I think the content strategy should be and must be providing this type of clarity because um, something that, that I found increasingly is a lot of times content strategists, um, whether they're, they're using that title or not, they might be the only designer in the room. They might be the only person at the meeting that's, that's coming in with design thinking um, and, and, something, and being in a position to advocate for that. So um, if, you know, be, being able to, to have some understanding of that, that purpose uh, behind our projects, uh, I, I find really important. Um, editorial calendars, that's one that comes up a lot, right, when you're going through the books. Like, let's develop an editorial calendar. Uh, okay. Let's create a content model. Um, and if you're doing these things without like, really understanding the vision, uh, you know, the way I kind of think about it is like, you could develop an editorial calendar that essentially becomes a system for being wrong on a regular basis. Right? Like, once a week, we're going to be doing something that is wrong. 
because it doesn't completely connect to our organization's aims and goals. Um, so, so when all this stuff comes flying at you, if you are dealing with a content problem avalanche, I think it's very helpful. Take a deep breath, step back, abstract things a little bit. Don't, you know, it, all the books say you just dive in and start doing an inventory. I, I don't necessarily think that's the best place to start. I think we need to, to have sort of a model for what content strategy is going to mean for our organizations. So this is a little uh, mnemonic I developed um, to just sort of help walk around um, and, and understand the, the various aspects of content uh, strategy and how it can affect our organizations. So VMT, uh, no special meaning. I just found some, some symmetry that worked nicely. Um, the first row, vision, mission, targets. Vision, mission, and targets. And I'm going to get into each one of these, sort of explain how they relate to each other. But that's sort of the business stuff, right? Um, sometimes uh, it might be a little hard to read up there, but that, that's the business row. Um, depending on, on how siloed or not siloed your organization is, the vision, the mission, and the targets, right, like who we're trying to reach, um, whom we're trying to affect, who our customers are, that's like the business and the sales kind of conversation. And then the bottom row there, that's, that's um, where I find myself working a lot, voice, message, and tone. And collectively, that's kind of the brand stuff. Um, you could also look at these divisions as the top row being product and the bottom row being content. Uh, and this is in abstraction. I want to emphasize that again, um, because I don't think that there are neat little boxes around each one of these areas. Um, but, but if you just sort of uh, try and apply the lessons of content strategy writ large without focusing in on one of these things, I, I think it, it, can be a little, it can be a little challenging to be effective. One other way to slice it here um, is vertically, uh, vision and voice kind of most relating to our organization, to, to who we are on the big picture level. Um, project is the middle column there, so our mission and message um, is sort of the thing that we're doing. It's the website redesign, it's the fundraising campaign, it's the uh, reunion event that we're putting on, right? That's the project. Um, and then the context, a, a particular situation there at the end with our targets and tone. Um, so this is sort of a way to kind of walk around a content problem and say, where, why does this suck? Like, why is this thing giving me a headache? Um, and how can I start to, to sort of debug it, pull this thing apart, and figure out where the friction is? Uh, it's not a methodology, um, but, but, but you know, in, in developer terms, I would consider this a bit of a debugging tool. Um, so I'm going to try and show you how to use it and, and maybe what's, what's wrong when you, when you don't have all of these things. So this will be a, a little running gag um, through our session. If you don't have all of this stuff very clear, right, these are different, just kind of crummy projects. I call this one the sales project. So if, if it's not really, there's no clear vision, there's no clear voice, we know exactly what we want to do and we know exactly who it's for. Right? That's, a, that's been very well articulated. So a lot of times that's how stuff hits my desk, right? I'm like, okay, but like, you know, what, like how is this going to change the world? Right? I don't think that's a ridiculous question to ask. Like, our organization exists for some reason, um, and for whatever that reason is, how is this mission serving it? So vision. Vision uh, and mission, that's, those are words that get thrown around a lot. I think it's very unfortunate that they've sort of, that like the terms have kind of become devalued. Like we all kind of snicker about vision and mission statements, right? Um, and and I'm, I was pretty snarky about it for a while too. Um, and I think the reason that we all sort of snicker about vision and mission statements is not because they're inherently meaningless tools, it's because most of them completely suck. Like they're just meaningless, absolutely meaningless garbage. Um, the, a fun game to play is like just take any vertical, higher education being a good one, um, swap a bunch of vision and mission statements around between different institutions. And you might not be able to tell the difference. Um, so to me, a vision is, is something that is realized. That's the way that I look at it. It's what will come to pass when, you, when you've been successful, what will have changed in the world. This isn't, like this, this isn't necessarily the specific thing that you are doing, but it's what you want to see changed in the world. Maybe what problem has been solved. Right? And, and this is what's missing from a lot of initiatives, is, is this, this vision around um, something that's not just about us, but about the world. 
if you want a really clear vision, and if you want a clear vision that's going to power your content, I think it needs to be ambi uh, very ambitious. Um, ambition is sort of a crucible for like BS, right? Like if, if you have a very ambitious vision, um, a lot of, it's going to be a lot easier to say no to things that are, are maybe somewhat trivial. And I also think it makes it easier to fight churn, um, which is something that I, I see a lot of people struggling with. Because um, a lot of times content strategy, you're kind of coming in on a project that's in motion, on an organization that's existed for a while, on something that is very problematic um, because these things haven't been clear from the beginning. I like this quote from Rework. Um, when you don't know what you believe, everything is an argument. Everything is an argument. Um, does that resonate for anyone? Like, I find that super true. I, um, I really like to, I like to argue about design. I like to get into it with people and like really hash things out. And I think that needs to happen as far upstream as possible, right? Um, if, if we're still, if we're arguing about the vision of a project halfway through, um, then any, literally any decision in the entire work that we're doing is just up for debate at all times. And that, that is a really kind of like, that's a morale suck. It's a really challenging way to work. Voice. Uh, counterpart to, to vision, uh, voice is, is us. It's, it's how we express our vision. It's who we are at any given point in time, right? You, they talk about people finding their voice. It's, it's a bit of a cliched phrase, but think about it a little bit, like finding your voice. That sort of implies that it's always been there, right? Like it's, it's not about creating your voice, building your voice. Um, this is why my, my hackles always raise a little bit around like brand building, you know, brand, brand development. Um, I, I, I guess that's, that's maybe a meaningful framework for some folks, but, but if, if you're thinking about building a voice, creating a voice, a lot of times that's, that's when you get the stuff that just doesn't smell right. You know, it's kind of tacked on and a little phony. Um, because I, I think a voice really needs to be about who we are. It's unique. It's your perspective on the world, right? A lot of people and a lot of organizations and institutions may very well share the same vision. And that's okay, right? Like a lot of people shared Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision, right? Shared his vision, but his voice is what was powerful, his unique perspective and the way that he expressed it. Um, so a clear voice is unique. Any Lebowski fans? Yes. All right. So thinking about names even, and I'll talk about this uh, more in a little bit, but um, you know, this is even starting at the level of our name, like that starts to shape your voice so much, right? Because that's like something you can't even necessarily control um, in how people perceive you. Um, and and it, that, it reflects back and sort of shapes um, your perspective on the world. I also think that, that uh, a unique voice is very important because um, we're, we're sort of starting to see a convergence. Um, I, I think uh, Josh's talk just now is, is really showing that, that you know, if, if physical objects now, like a thing just in your room can be wired up and become part of like this digital space, everyone's sort of starting to converge to be in the same business. Um, Karen McGrain's keynote at the IA Summit um, two years back, uh, she was sort of talking about how she was advocating that content strategists need to start thinking about themselves um, as sort of ch like change, uh, focusing on change management, right? That that's really what the work is. It's just sort of guiding people, keeping us sane, keeping the vision clear over time as things evolve. Um, and having that, that really clear and unique voice I think is gonna be important because you know, look at how cross-disciplinary things are getting, how many of us are coming together in this room with different backgrounds but starting to deal with the same issues. So sometimes you have a mission and a message and not much else. I call this one the grilled cheese. Like very hot, lots of activity in the middle. Right? These are like the rush projects where people just absolutely have to get the thing done and it lands on your desk. Um, who's it for? We don't know. Why are we doing it? No, 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 no. I've made a lot of grilled cheese. Um, <laughs> this is making sense so far? Following along? Cool. Feel free to jump in with questions. I, I'll have to repeat them um, for the, the webcast, but, but cool. All right, so mission. Um, again, this is one that I'm using maybe, maybe a little differently than you're used to hearing it. Um, that's just one of the challenges of putting one of these things together. It's like, 
right? I'm, I'm kind of tr I'm trying to rewire your brains a little bit on mission. Um, mission is something that it can be accomplished, right? Mission accomplished. Um, another way to say this is that they end. They end at some point. It's done. The project is over. <laughs> we have finished the work. Um, and if it, if it sounds like if if the if as you would describe a mission like sounds like this impossible task that will never be completed and it's like your life's work, I, I would put that more in the vision category. Um, missions to me it, for this framework, it's really ju it's just the activities. It's any of the stuff that we do, and this is can be really hard to like hold in your head, which is why I like make little grids that I can draw on a whiteboard. Um, but however invested your role is in publishing a website or you know, running an, uh, an email marketing department or what have you, none of that stuff is the end goal, right? Like our, 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 we don't want to have a website, right? Like the humanity doesn't need websites. We need what they do for us, right? Humanity doesn't need um, institutions of higher education. We need educated people. We need, you know, we, we need like those more humane connections. So like all of the stuff and the activities that we're doing, um, those should be related to a vision. Um, I, I, as you'll find this in, in the corporate world a lot, um, especially like once a company has gone public, like a lot of times what they're existing for is to keep existing. That's it. Uh, I think that sucks and it, it makes for a lot of crummy stuff out in the world. I really like this quote um, from the landscape photographer Ansel Adams. There's nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. And I think about that as relates to our, uh, excuse me, to our missions, to the stuff that we're doing, our activities. Um, because particularly um, with the way that the, the user experience field has developed, we're getting really, really good at making really, really um, sharp images of things. Um, even people like me, who, who are more writers than designers, um, I, can, I can pull up Axur or OmniGraffle and start to make something that looks really done, really fast. Right? Like it looks like the thinking is there. So I can make a really sharp image of something um, that doesn't necessarily have a sharp concept behind it. Um, so I, I think as content strategists, we should be focusing on um, you know, what are the tools, patterns, and habits that we can help our organization with for developing sharp concepts. Right? Like where is the iteration um, cycle around improving the concept, not just the execution of the concept? So message, um, counterpart to mission. Uh, message, you'll you hear messaging, that's something we talk about a lot and everyone throws the word messaging around and no one understands it um, or, or, or uses it in the same way. For me, a message is, is just kind of how we're articulating what we're doing. It's how we talk about the thing, right? So a message is designed. It's an, uh, if you just look it up in the dictionary, a message is an idea, loose fuzzy thing up here. It's an idea made suitable for transmission. Now I can share that idea with you. So you know, when they talk about being on message, it's, it's are we clearly and consistently articulating the idea that we have, the concept in the same way? And clear messages have structure. Right? Most important to least important. There's an organization to what it is that we're talking about. Uh, messages are not taglines. I'll run into this a lot and I, I try and push back on it. Um, sometimes when folks talk about the messaging for a thing, they're really talking about the tagline, right? I'm loving it is meaningless, is meaningless. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's just a little, no it's this noise that's just meant to make you evoke a certain thing. It's really more of a symbol, right? Like a lot of the taglines that we have um, and, and these kind of short, pithy phrases to describe all of our products, they're not really communication. They're, they're sort of symbols that, that just represent little simple ideas. David Algarvey tells us that people who think well write well. Woolly-minded people write woolly memos, woolly letters, and woolly speeches. So, you know, the clarity of thinking, the clarity of output. Clarity of thinking, clarity of output of what it is that we're doing. Uh, I find this in organizations all the time, right? That, that this, this, if you see a product that just seems kind of crummy or an initiative that falls flat, uh, why is that? A lot of times it's, it's, it wasn't the execution, it was the original concept. Any guesses on this one? We know our vision and voice, we know who it's for, we know how we're gonna talk about it. There's just not really any meat to the activity. I call this the, we need to be on Pinterest. <laughs> right. 
It just, it's the th like we, you couldn't even particularly articulate what the thing is that you're doing. Like I've created an account and I will now just generally generate activity there. Um, to what end? Uh, I don't know. So moving in the last column, the context, um, we'll come back through with some tools for each one of these um, and talk about how they, how they interact. Uh, targets. Targets are chosen. It's something that you aim for, uh, right? Uh, you're making a call on your targets, even if your decision is, I'm not going to define who this is for. I'm just going to let people come to me. Um, so that's, you know, I'm going to shoot at everything. Um, clear targets are specific, um, right? Like imagine if you had some very, uh, like, like extremely detailed military strategy, and then like the very last page of it, it says, and when you get there, just, you know, shoot the bad guys. Like, well, who, who do, how do we know who the bad guys are? I don't know, you know, they're probably wearing a different color than us, <laughs> right? So clear targets have to be very specific. Um, and, and this is where things fall apart a lot. It's, it's hopefully you're seeing how it's nested a little further down in, in what an organization or an activity is. Um, but it, if, if we're off, then all of the work that's got into it so far um, is wasted. I also, I kind of cheated for this one to make a nice little symmetrical framework, but I also sort of think about targets as uh, what we're aiming for, um, a little bit as far as goals, um, and also channels come into play a little bit, right? So depending on the type of work that you do, you might be thinking of targets more as this is for, the thing that I'm working on is for Facebook, right? That might be okay. And then finally, tone. Um, tone is responsive. Tone is responsive. It's chosen. Um, it's appropriate for a situation if it's going to be clear, right? So uh, the relationship between voice and tone, I think, are really important. Um, there is that messaging in the middle, which is what we're saying. Um, but, but voice and tone, got, when I was kind of soaking up all of this content strategy stuff, let me figure out how to be a content strategist, everyone's talking about voice and tone, voice and tone, voice and tone. Um, and they point you to voiceandtone.com, like the MailChimp site, where they have their voice and tone guidelines, which is neat. And I had no idea how to make that useful in my organization. Like, this is neat. I wasn't there. I don't get what this means. So I, I had to sort of break down for myself what voice and tone means. And I, I hope that this can help you. Um, but, but if voice is who you are, um, you're always the same person. Tone is sort of how you behave in a given situation, um, right? You are going to carry yourself and speak differently at a funeral than you would at a party. Right, but that doesn't make you a different person. You still have the same voice and perspective on the world. So clear tone has to be appropriate. Uh, I have this, this term I use um, called awesome talk. This sort of drives me crazy, right? So Steve Krug's got happy talk that, welcome to our website. We hope that you enjoy yourself here and blah, 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 the stuff that people don't need. Um, I'm starting to see this awesome talk, which is like, oh, this thing's kind of lifeless. Um, let's, just, let's just throw in some, some words like, ninja and radical and like just like s slap on some emotional language to, to try and make it, you know, friendlier. Um, Idiocracy, anyone? It is a movie you cannot unsee. Uh, this is like my favorite moment in any movie. It's just, it's about how like uh, people did not use this framework and then the world became terrible. Um, no, uh, but you know, there's, there's just like all these phrases have just sort of lost their meaning, right? So you, I, I see I love you strapped on to a lot of stuff. Uh, this is something that a weird little habit I have too of collecting um, change logs for iOS updates. I do it less now that they've hidden it from us and it, it happens automatically. Uh, but this is an idea of tone in action, right? So path has an update, bug fixes. Instagram has an update, uh, minor tweaks and bug fixes. Plants vs. Zombies also has, you know, essentially nothing to tell you there are some bug fixes. But the, the tone that they used was, was totally them um, and, and situational and they, you know, it's sort of an annoying thing to be updating your app. So they had a little fun with it. So sometimes you have the first four things all figured out. Um, you know, we, we've got these, you know, we have a, uh, the vision is clear, we have opinions on, on what we should be doing, um, but the targets and tone, that, that last mile, the who it's for is just missing. So I call this one the C-suite, executive suite, maybe the dean's office, I don't know if that works better for you guys. Um, but just like, you know, well, who is this for? Oh, it's for everyone. Everyone, everyone? <laughs> like in the world? Yeah, it's for everyone. Okay, this is gonna be a hard one. 
So here they all are together. Vision, mis vision mission targets, voice message tone. Um, and I really like to s just sort of play with this and see how they, how they interact with each other. So we talked about voice and tone a little bit. Um, you know, uh, thinking about vision and message. Right, so, so now, like, you know, maybe go across, across some diagonals a little bit. Um, your message, you know, if that's the stuff that you're saying about what you're doing, um, ideally it's, re it's tied to an activity. Ideally it's tied to an activity. Um, if you don't have uh, a clear mission, like a thing that you're doing that people can sort of grok and grab onto and go, okay, this is interesting and I can see what is happening here. Um, tying your messaging to your vision, right, always talking about what you believe in and how the world should be, that gets a little obnoxious, right? That's, that's all, all, all talk, no rock. Um, if you have, you know, if you have a mission, um, but there's no, there, you know, there's no subtlety of tone to, to what you're doing, like that comes off as very aloof or indifferent, right? It's just sort of like, you know, this is important and you should just know that it's important and, and screw you for, for not getting it. Um, so I, I, I think this can, can be kind of a helpful way to, to sort of debug things. I'm gonna go into tools here for each one of these, um, but first, I, just kind of a check-in. How are we feeling? Good? There's a question? Yeah. Um, so I just had an issue with security because you know, my website is all private and I have to use the name drive which makes it have a lot of lower level pages. And it has Um, so for the, the folks at home, um, the, the question is around, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, right? On a given project, there's, just, there's so much, right? If we have tens of thousands of web pages that, that are vision, are, are, we're getting some fuzz here. Am I still on? Hello, hello. Does it sound amplified? No? See, I don't think it does. Sorry, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Okay, cool. Um, give me a moment, I'll catch up. So, so there's a lot of work to be done, right? Like content strategy is not simple and the, the reason that, you know, um, there's a lot of cake and a lot of drinking and content strategy jokes <laughs> and at conferences. Um, yeah, so, so, so like how do I take this home, right? Like that's, that's what I, I kind of get a lot. It's like how do I get everybody on board with this? Um, it's really, really challenging. I don't have a perfect answer. A part of why I'm doing this is I kind of, I need to learn as much as I can about how this makes sense to other people so that I can see what the best tools are um, for bringing it back. One thing that, that I have worked toward doing is making sure that I really understand um, not what's wrong with the content, but like how it affects the people that have to work on it. Um, so when we hired um, our second content strategist at Wolfram, um, and I got a title change with lead and, and there's more you know, initiative around content strategy, um, I used it as an excuse to go back in and ask all the questions um, that I like, didn't ask in the first year that I worked there. You know, so like, kind of like, hey, this is the new guy, so if you could explain to him how this thing happens or you know, like where, the, like how the system works. Um, but we set up interviews with anyone we could find in the company who did content. They were responsible for updating it, changing it, writing it, whatever, like using it even. Um, and just we sort of put a questionnaire together around like pain points. Um, and, and just talk to people and talk to people and talk to people and just pulled that together. 
um, you know, kind of aggregated them a bit. Um, we put a SWOT analysis um, together of our results and shared that with stakeholders. So we sort of talked through like, so here's what's wrong, you know, not framed quite like that, but you know, here, here are some of the concerns that, we've, that, that have been raised and that we've all been talking about as problematic with our content. Here's how it's affecting our people. Here's how it's affecting like their efficiency and the work that needs to be done. Um, so, you know, and, and we sort of let them prioritize it a little bit, like of these things, which seems like most important to you. Um, and what you might find is that um, the stuff that makes your job hard is making their job hard too. Right, like a lot of our, you know, you think like sales executives, um, they, they don't have to muck around with the stuff. They want to be out there shaking hands and talking to people. So they want all of your, um, you know, messaging uh, to be really well organized and easy to find and copy and paste and know that they're safe to grab it, you know, from a centralized location and it's not going to be old on the website. Um, I don't know if that helps at all, but, but just kind of really like focusing on the people, right? Like that's kind of why I talk about friction and churn. Um, it's just, it's all the morale sucks of, of this stuff not being clear that I think really affects our teams. Okay. Other questions before we move on? Cool. Okay. So tool time. I'm going to go through each one of the sections and think about, you know, if, if we've got a problem, if we feel like the problem's at the vision level, voice, mission, et cetera, what can we do? Um, so sometimes, you know, what's wrong with our visions is, the, uh, is that they just don't exist. That can happen. Um, more often, I think it's that there's, there's not coordination around it, right? The, the whole team or organization doesn't understand what the vision is. Um, sometimes, if it's a smaller project, um, right, this is, this is kind of like Russian nesting dolls, like each initiative within each initiative, like you could still apply these six boxes to. Um, so on a smaller initiative, you know, it might just be that, well, you know, the vision is someone else's job, and we're going to kind of shove it off, off on them. Um, one thing you can do is, is put a, a manifesto of sorts together. Um, write it down and stick it on the wall. Uh, this is something I did um, when I was trying to develop a voice, um, uh, you know, kind of articulate the voice of an app startup that I'd started working with. They wanted to do some consulting work. Um, they were very opinionated about software. They had really good kind of design principles at the core of what they were doing. Um, but their web page was just like, you know, when I joined, it's just like a mess of acronyms, like all the programming languages that they knew. Um, and it, people weren't really, really getting it. Um, so we just kind of did a workshop where the, the five people on the team just sort of laid out what our sort of principles were, like how we approached our work. Um, we, we looked for overlap, um, synthesized those a little bit. Um, and actually to sort of make it stick and make it a thing that was like really gonna be present in our minds, um, we, we made a little guide book out of them, published it online. I um, actually turned them all into posters and put them on the wall. Um, this is dangerous territory, right? This is like really close to that like motivational poster kind of stuff, you know, is this good for the company? Um, but that, that's like the fine edge that you walk with visions and missions and this kind of stuff is that if you, if you are, you know, if you're younger me and you're just like, you know, uh, everything corporate and organizational is stupid and we should all just go be artists and live in the woods um, and, and slough off the vision and mission um, articulation, then, then it's, it's really challenging to do our work. Um, so, you do, so, so some sort of manifesto, some sort of statement that has a lot of, of oomph to it can be helpful. Um, so that, a manifesto would sort of be you focused. Maybe you're in like a problem solving mode. Um, another tool I really like um, is called the problem statement. Um, I got this from a, a talk by Whitney Hess a few years back. Um, like many of the tools um, that, that we use for this stuff, seem simple and obvious. And it seems simple and obvious, and so we look at it and go, oh yeah, okay, I understand this. But then we don't actually do it. Like, take this, apply it to a project, actually do it. Write out who needs what, because why. Stick it at the top of every document, right? Put it at the top of wireframes. Um, when it comes to vision, something that I think is, is really important is um, keeping it visible, keeping it present. Um, so if I've, if I've been able to pull a vision statement from an organization or a project, um, or a, a problem statement, I'll put it on the top of everything, absolutely everything that I have. If we're walking through wireframes around a problem, I will have that vision um, or that problem statement visible. So those are a couple of my favorites around vision. Um, voice. Uh, voice problems can, can be tricky. Um, a lot of times we're kind of aping somebody else's style, right? Like we haven't, like when you're younger, 
Um, and you're sort of finding your voice, right? It's like, okay, I'm gonna be a punk rocker for a little while, okay. Uh, you know, maybe I'm actually preppy. Like, I'll, you know, let's go to a shop at Eddie Bauer and try on some preppy clothes for a while. You know, so you're sort of feeling and finding yourself out. Um, and sometimes the organizations are actually in that kind of adolescent phase where we're just sort of like kind of trying stuff out and, 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 and um, you know, seeing what will stick. Um, you know, if we've been around for 100 years, you know, it might be time to, to figure that out. Um, sometimes our voices are just a, a little soft and weak, um, and maybe we, we could have them a little stronger. So I mentioned this already, um, but I think a really good name, um, especially if you're starting up some new thing, I think names are vitally important, and I think they are, are kind of almost at the foundation of our voice. Um, it's, one of, it's one of those things that, you know, as a person, you don't get choice over, at least initially, um, for all of our projects we do. Um, so when I see people do brainstorming, name storming, they're trying to come up with a name for stuff, they always go to the thesaurus and like start looking for like stuff that's related to it, um, which I think is the wrong direction to move because that's sort of assuming that you like already completely understand it and you just need a word that's like, you know, Latin or something to represent it. Um, but if you look for hyponyms, so type of going a little bit deeper down the stack, like can we get a little more specific here around the name? Um, I think that can be really useful. Uh, one thing, I just, I drop this in like every talk I can, be really careful about how you name the stuff around your project. Because um, sometimes, sometimes we're not ready to name something, right? It's we haven't bought the domain yet, so to speak. Um, we still have to name our meetings something, right? If the calendar appointment's gonna go out there, you have to put something in the subject line of the email. Be very careful, be very careful. I have a theory that a vast majority of products out in the world are named after whatever the project manager put in the first meeting like appointment. And it just carried on and no one ever talked about it. And it just became the name. So that's a tough one. Uh, this is another one I've done, um, an elevator pitch workshop. So maybe, maybe your voice feels a little schizophrenic, right? You're kind of, it's seeming like maybe you're different people depending on who's talking. Um, did, did a workshop at, at my last job um, where uh, we, had, we had a podcasting studio, which was easy, but you could use an iPhone or a tape recorder. Um, brought people in. I had a little script that I used sort of like I was at a cocktail party um, and just asked them, like, what do you do? Okay, what, what do you like about that? Who have you worked with? Um, recorded their answers um, individually, and then we brought everyone together and played it back, which is, you know, there's a lot of seat squirming because that's kind of uncomfortable. Um, but we, we, we were a pretty connected team. Um, and being able, like you just saw like light bulbs firing off like constantly as pe you know, or like a lot of kind of head slapping as they realized that they just personally weren't articulating um, things very well, um, that maybe they weren't on the same page about some things that they thought they were. Uh, that was a really fundamental change in like kind of our confidence almost going out there um, and talking about, about ourselves. This is another one um, that you could use. Maybe the voice is, is mostly sort of there, but no one's ever taken the time to articulate it. Um, if you have a lot of web content already, there are probably some themes inherent in your content. Stuff that you're talking about over and over, and maybe certain perspectives or opinions that are being expressed over and over. Um, we do content audits, which is, okay, let's look at all the stuff we have. But within a web page, especially if our content's not very good, a lot of times there's more than one idea being expressed, um, or it's being expressed in a myriad of ways across our sites. Um, so I, I've done this just with, with OmniGraffle. I'll take screenshots, um, get like a translucent colored block so it's like a highlighter. Um, and like for, for Wolfram, we have themes around computation, automation, um, and, and, and similar. And I just went through to see where that was showing up in our sites. Right? So, so like where, where are these various themes that we have showing up? Um, and making it visual like that made it really clear, like okay, in meeting after meeting, we're saying that X is really important to who we are, but like vis I can just at a glance now see that that doesn't exist on our homepage, right? Or that it, that is not represented in the terms that we've used in our main navigation. Like that kind of opinion isn't carrying through there. So those are a few tools around voice. Um, missions. Uh, this is where a lot of the, the kind of day-to-day -day, um, problems and, and maybe the most common ones that we run into. A lot of times they're just underspecified. Um, there's no end date or goal in sight. Um, a lot of times we're doing stuff that we just that isn't connected to, to the vision, um, which we should probably just stop doing once we know that. Um, a tool I really enjoy is concept modeling uh, or concept diagrams. Uh, it's a specific type of diagram um, that, that just sort of 
takes this fuzzy thing that is an organization, uh, an institution, um, sort of makes an exploded view model of it. I've done this as a workshop, um, but it's, it's a really neat technique where you just sort of say, um, you, you make little facts, right? So, um, you know, uh, dogs are animals. Right? It's like that's, that's two nouns and a little verb in between that sort of define something that you can now refer to and say everyone agrees on this. Um, so I've, I've done that for various pr uh, projects. Uh, ones that I like to articulate in concept diagrams is like, what are we saying is a brand? What is like, in an, you know, what is a product? Uh, what, is, what is a team or a department? Um, so there's a, a lot of material out there um, on concept diagrams, so I'd look into that. Uh, I like this one a lot. I, I, I find it, uh, I'm, uh, that not many people are familiar with it, so I, I like to share it. Um, it's called Moscow. Uh, this is really nice if maybe you had some big pie in the sky, blue sky brainstorming session, the whiteboard's all covered, you know, and then um, the hippo in the room says, okay, great, let's do it. And you're like, wait, do what? That, the, you know, the, we just, we just, the brainstorming session we just had, let's do it. No, 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 we can't do all of those things. That, that no, that can't happen. Um, so I like this, the Moscow technique. Um, it's a four, four little grids um, that you lay out. Stuff that you absolutely must include. The thing won't work, right? So the car needs an engine, and it needs gasoline, and probably a steering wheel. Um, you know, should include. Um, that's things that we would like to include, and if it turns out that it's easy to do so, uh, like, you know, this is usually where we have to talk to the developers. But if it's easy, yes, let's do this as well. Uh, could include is uh, that's sort of like your blocker column. So there's a thing that we would really, really like to do, um, but there's something in the way right now, and you articulate that. Uh, and won't include, and this is the tough one, um, but you are deciding this is what we're not going to do right now. Um, and if that seems scary for your stakeholders, you can call it will include in a future release. <laughs> and you use the version two lie. Um, it's a lie, it's a lie, but it's an effective one. Uh, creative briefs, really helpful around, um, around missions. Um, there's a, a good article out there from UIE on the short, uh, short form creative brief, um, where they just kind of write in like a half page style what the heck they're trying to do. Um, and they read it back out loud before every meeting. Very cool. Uh, I'll fly through a few more here. Uh, message, message architecture is a nice one. I talked about this in my writing toolbox um, talk yesterday. Um, Margo Bloomstein has some good stuff out there on this. Um, there, she describes it in content strategy at work. Um, but it's, if you've ever done a card sorting exercise for your information architecture or your main navigation, um, what if you did a card sorting exercise around, um, around your messaging, around what you're trying to communicate? Um, you know, how do these ideas relate? Which ones are the most important? If you're working on the web page level, um, perspective can always be very helpful um, in articulating like, okay, I need to understand the context of where people came in and where they're going to. Um, so I, I like this one called Core and Paths, where instead of just, you know, on a discrete page of your, of your deliverable showing what the page is, you're sort of showing the broader context around it. Um, so it has some things on, on where people are coming from and where they're going to and what they're looking for. Targets, uh, just two for this one, personas. If you don't have them, I really recommend working on them. It's incredibly useful. Um, there's a just whole wealth of literature um, out there online around persona-driven design. But it's, it's just, it's describing and articulating who it is that you are trying to reach. I um, mean, being very intentional and specific about that for a given initiative. Um, and I also think understanding our channels is very important. Um, knowing all of the sites that we have, knowing all the social accounts that we have, um, and, and kind of keeping that list visible during design projects, during, during your thinking phases, um, can, can really help you plan uh, a little more intelligently. Um, and for tone, I just have one that I, I would like to share. Um, a lot of people do personas. I don't find empathy maps to be as common. Uh, empathy maps are really cool. It's like you can sort of tactically apply it to a persona. So you have personas that maybe work for the whole organization, but now you have a very specific project that you're working on, a specific task and situation. And so you could take that same person, put them in a new situation, um, and use an empathy map technique, um, which gets at what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're hearing, um, and, and I find that very helpful. So if you find yourself saying, I don't understand, if you're hearing that from your team, take a breath, step back a little bit, Try and abstract things. 
Hopefully this diagram can help. And um, yeah, don't be, don't be afraid to be a little ornery about some of this kind of stuff. So I think it's really important. And that's it. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I ran a little long, so uh, thank you, folks at home. I'm going to get out of here in respect to the next speaker. Um, but if you would like the slides, kubi.co slash VMT. I'm around through the end of the day, and I'll be at whatever the thing is tonight. Um, so feel free to grab me and chat. Thank you.